these shoes cost as much as my monthly car payment. I really hope they're fast. All right, don't forget to do the whole like, comment, subscribe thing. That's what keeps these videos coming. All right, before we get into the specifics of this shoe, let's talk a little bit about the history and the theory of energy return foam, since it plays a, such a big role in the design of this shoe. Now, if you remember from physics class, the law of the conservation of energy says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed in a closed system. It just changes form and it moves around. So when you're running, as your foot comes down to strike the ground, the potential energy of your foot moving towards the ground changes into kinetic energy. Some of that energy is lost in the friction between your shoe and the ground, and some more of it is lost in the sound of your footstep. But most of it goes into compressing the foam in your shoe. The quicker that foam returns to its original size and shape, the more energy gets returned back into your foot to continue on the next stride. Now in 2016, Adidas started playing with a foam called ETPU, Expanded Thermoplastic Polyurethane. They marketed it as Boost Foam, and they found that when they put it in shoes, it returned to the original size and shape quicker than any material that they had ever used before. This was really bad news for Nike because Adidas was already making the fastest running shoes in the world. The marathon world record had been set the previous year in a, another pair of Adidas and now they were coming out with this game-changing material. Nike at the time wasn't really up on energy return material. They were making things more like this. This is the free 3.0. This was developed in response to the minimalist or barefoot running trend that was popular in the late 2000s, early 2010s. That was a trend that Nike was actually pretty slow to capitalize on. The design for this shoe was largely taken from a shoe made by Reebok called the Real Flex, a shoe that I really like and really wish that they would bring back on the market. But what that meant for Nike is that a company which prides itself on being the most technically advanced footwear manufacturer in the world had been late on not only one, but the two biggest trends in running in the 21st century. Couple that with the fact that this was around the time when Kanye West left Nike for Adidas, and Nike was also dealing with a lot of internal issues regarding its treatment of female employees, and things were not really going very well for the swoosh. It might not seem like it now, but as recently as four or five years ago, it looked like Adidas could overtake Nike as the biggest shoe manufacturer in the world. Nike's response to this was to create something called the Breaking Two Project. They recruited the best marathon runners, including Eliud Kipchoge, widely regarded as the greatest marathon runner of all time, and developed a brand new shoe from the ground up in an effort to allow them to run a marathon in under two hours, something that had never been done before. This shoe here is a direct descendant of the original Breaking Two shoes. And I wanna go through some of the features which have stayed with these shoes over the years. And the first thing I want to point out is this incredibly large landing pad in the front of the shoe. You can see it's actually wider than the upper on the shoe, than the body of the shoe. This shoe is very much designed to be a front striking shoe, more like a sprint shoe than a traditional jogging shoe. So much so that when you get to the heel of the shoe, most of this is exposed foam. There's only a few little rubber inserts for walking. This foam is Nike Zoom X foam. This is their top of the line energy return foam. This is something that they developed in-house. It shows up on their best shoes. It's the lightest and it gives you the most energy return of any of the materials that they use. They have several energy return foams, but this is the best one. In addition to the foam, sandwiched between the two foam layers is a carbon plate. You can actually see part of it up here. It's exposed underneath this gigantic air bubble. The carbon plate and the energy return foam give you a one-two kick in energy return. First, you get the bounce from the foam, but the carbon plate is designed as your foot strikes the ground, your weight wants to bend the shoe this way downward, and the carbon plate snaps it up. So you're getting two energy return systems in this shoe. And in this shoe, you're actually getting a third, which is this giant air bubble in the front. It's actually two different air pods in the front. What you might be able to see is this air bubble has a series of vertical ribs. As you compress that, those ribs get shorter and fatter, and they want quickly to snap back into their vertical orientation. So you're getting three times the energy return out of this shoe. 
one of the things that I've always loved about the whole Breaking 2 series of shoes is this tail here. Nike claims that it's to aid in aerodynamics on the front swing of, the, of your stride as you're coming forward to help air close up behind it. I'm not sure how much of a difference that really makes, but it's shown up on every version of the Nike Super Shoes since the original Breaking 2 shoe. One of the things I have noticed with the shape of the heel of this shoe is this kind of Taurus shape with the divot down the middle really adds a lot of stiffness to the shoe. Normally with a shoe with this much stack height, this much uh, foam here, you would expect a lot of ankle roll. It would be a very soft uh, shoe. But this shoe really feels pretty stiff and planted, and I think it's largely due to this geometry. This, this channel stiffens it up. The extra length helps to stiffen up the shoe. So that's the Nike Zoom Alpha Fly, the latest in Nike's super shoe technology. Before we get this on the road, I want to talk about the shoe I decided to compare this to. When I was trying to think of a shoe to compare to the Alpha Fly, I went through a lot of different ideas. I first thought about an older pair of Energy Return Nikes that I have, but I didn't think there was really that much difference to matter all that much. Then I thought about a new pair of Air Max that I have, but Air Max really isn't a running shoe anymore. And so finally I decided to go all the way back to this, the Nike Cortez, one of the first shoes to wear the Nike swoosh. This shoe was released to the public in 1972, but history and versions of this shoe can be traced back to the mid 60s. This was designed to be a high mileage training shoe for elite marathon runners, but the comfort, the availability, and the design made it really popular with the general public and it helped to spark the jogging and the fitness boom of the 70s. Since then, this shoe has gone on to become an icon. Everyone from Forrest Gump to Kendrick Lamar has worn it. And I'm excited to get it on the road and see how it actually performs as an athletic shoe. Anyone that knows the Cortez is familiar with the famous herringbone tread pattern. It's been around on this shoe since its original version. I was surprised to see that the Alpha Fly actually has a very similar tread pattern on both the front landing pad and these uh, heel inserts. Um, this is unusual for Nike Super Shoes. Usually they're very smooth, um, almost like a racing flat. Well, they are a racing flat. And I've actually found a lot of versions of Nike Super Shoes to be almost too slippery, especially in wet conditions. So I was surprised to see this. Um, I'm not sure if it's a direct tribute to the Cortez. Nike has been known to go back into the archives and pull design features from older shoes. So even if it's not, it's still a really cool similarity and it makes me excited to compare these two shoes. Jones Island. Among other things, it's home to Milwaukee's biggest sewage treatment plant, but it also gives us a nice, long, flat, nearly traffic-free straightaway that we can test these shoes out at full speed. All right, here we go. Half mile all out. Cortez on the bottom, Alphas on the top. See, I'm starting a little bit further back with the Alphas. That's because I'm taking something of a rolling start. The extra speed at the start cancels out the extra distance. See a very aggressive start with the Alphas. I haven't run very much in the Alphas, and the springiness, the smoothness of them makes it a little bit difficult to gauge pace. I've done a lot more running in the Cortez. That's because when I got them, the leather uppers were pretty stiff, and they needed some break-in. You kind of forget with modern running shoes that are ready to go right out the box. Older shoes did need a break-in period, and these Cortez are just now getting to the point where I can feel like I can run in them. Um, the one thing also I did forget about Cortez and older Nikes in general is just how narrow they are. I kind of wish I'd gone up about a half size because that toe box is really tight on my feet. I'm really feeling it a little bit. Very different strategies as I'm running in these shoes. With the Alphas, I'm going all out from the start and just trying to hold on as we come about the halfway mark. 105 in the Alphas, that's a pretty fast opening quarter mile for me. Even on the track, a 105 first lap would be pretty quick. See about 111, 112 for the Cortez, even that's pretty respectable. But with the Alphas, my idea was to go out as fast as I can and just kind of hold on. And the Cortez uh, aren't as fast, can't sprint in them just as quite as much. Uh, so the idea is to keep as smooth a pace as possible and then try and kick at the end. And you see with the alphas, I'm really starting to, to feel it here. I think that opening pace was a little bit high and you see really falling off the pace here. Cortez still look nice and smooth. 
Starting to open up a pretty good gap with the alphas here. Time difference is about 10 seconds, about 50 meters or so. See, I'm starting to catch a bit of a second win with the alphas. Stride rate starting to come back. Stride starting to smooth out a little bit. This third quarter of any run, but especially a half mile run, is always the toughest for me. First half is easy. You're pretty fresh. And the last quarter or so, you're kicking for the finish line. But this third quarter is where you really start to feel the pain and you really have to kind of stretch out, stay calm, stay relaxed uh, as you come through and get ready for that final kick. I have to say I'm really impressed with the Cortez at this point. Like I said, there was a lengthy break-in process. I wasn't sure what to expect from them, if I was even going to be able to run in them, if they were going to kill my feet, if I was going to have to just give up halfway through. But if you treat the Cortez for what they are, a distance runner, when you stay nice, smooth pace, they really do their job. Uh, they feel good, good traction, good support, good comfort. And they're a shoe that you really can still run in. See the Alphas coming up towards the finish line here, 305, 306. And that's a result I'll take in this cold and wind. And that's a good time for me. Recent 800s on the track have been around 243. 800 meters is a little shorter than a half mile, and the track is always going to be faster than the road, so that's not a bad time. Cortez coming in at 320, that also is not a bad time. I'm impressed with how both of these shoes were able to hold up on this run, and it'll be uh, exciting to do a little bit more work with them. All right, so I'm here under the Hone Bridge in the harbor of Milwaukee. Jones Island, where we just ran, it's directly behind me. Now you might be saying, these are marathon shoes. What does a half mile run really prove? And I feel you on that, so today we're gonna to turn it up to a 5K. So here's the course. We're gonna start where Pittsburgh Street crosses the river, and then we're basically going to follow the river as it flows towards the harbor mouth and Lake Michigan. Cross underneath the Hone Bridge, and then we're gonna to start to head back north through Lakeshore State Park. Once we exit uh, the park, we'll pass by Discovery World and the Art Museum, and then we'll head east out onto the lake uh, through Veterans Park, ending on the jetty. This will cover just about five kilometers. All right, here we go on the 5K. I chose this as the start because this is one of my favorite views down the river with that old swim bridge in the middle of the water. We'll get some nice views of the city on this course. So we have a slight downhill coming off the drawbridge followed by a sharp right turn and you see how carefully I have to take those steps. That extra stack height in the shoes really creates a feeling of instability on downhills and turns and when you combine those two into one thing, you really have to mind your steps very carefully. I like to start 5Ks pretty fast and having to scrub that speed around the turn has really thrown me off my rhythm a little bit. So I'm trying to settle in here. Now as I settle into a pace, you do start to see what makes these shoes so very special. Just every stride seems to take less effort than you would expect it to. They, this funny thing about these shoes is they don't feel fast. You know, there's some shoes you strap on and you instantly know that they're fast or once you start moving with them, they feel fast. These shoes don't feel fast, they just feel smooth. There's been plenty of times when I've run in these shoes and taken double takes on some of the time intervals because it doesn't feel that I'm moving that fast and the times that come up just seem to be way too good for the effort that's required. It reminds me of that old saying, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. That's what these shoes are. They're smooth and they're fast. We're into Lakeshore State Park here. This is the smallest state park in all of Wisconsin. One of my favorite places in the city. It offers some beautiful views of the city. And it's a beautiful uh, reclaimed uh, landscape. As we come around this soft right hand turn coming down from the bridge will be about the halfway point of the run. Alpha's coming through in about 10 and a half minutes, Cortez 12 and some change. 
Here we come past the art museum and begin the long eastbound path into the lake. And this is the trickiest part of the run because you pick up wind off the lake, you feel temperature change, air density changes, and this is the last mile or so of the race, so you're a little bit beat up by this point. This is where you really got to push. Went up to the finish line here on this long jetty. You see water on both sides of us. Beautiful view of downtown Milwaukee. So we come through to the finish. So let's talk times. Alpha Fly finished the run in 20 minutes, 43 seconds. Cortez, 22.21. That's about a 10% difference between the two shoes. Now a disclaimer, the distance tracking app that I used recorded the distance at 4.6 kilometers rather than an even five. So these times are really kind of important relative to each other more so than an absolute time for a 5K. Now for what it's worth, I did over the course of making this video run an official chip time 5K in the Alpha Flies finishing in a time of 21.56, which is pretty similar pace to the Alpha Fly time that I hand timed. All right, so where'd all that running get us? Well, I like these shoes. They're fun to run in and they made me enjoy road running in a way that I haven't in a very long time. And I think if I spend a little bit more time with them, I could start to put up some pretty decent times in a 5K. But there are some significant drawbacks with it. One is the stability. That high stack height is really difficult on downhill runs and on turns. Now this again maybe is something if I spent more time with the shoe I could get more comfortable with it. And I've never been a great downhill runner, although I've always been pretty good on turns. Um, so that might just be familiarity with the shoe, but I, that height really starts to work against you in some of those uh, more tricky um, runs, more tricky maneuvers. The other thing really that is a drawback on these is the price. $275, close to $300 with tax. That's a lot of money. Um, these really made me actually go back and look at another pair of shoes I own, um, an old pair of Zoom Flies. Those go for about $160. Now, you don't get the air bubble, obviously, and you're dealing with React foam instead of uh, Zoom X foam with the Flies, but $115 difference is a significant difference, and you can get yourself a nice pair of secondary training shoes with that. And these very much are race only shoes. You might rotate them in for fast training sessions every now and again, but these definitely are not everyday shoes. Uh, the, the carbon plate, the stiffness of it will really start to hurt your feet. And besides that, um, they're not built to last on everyday running. These are race shoes. They're built to last for as long as the race takes, maybe a couple races after that. But if you wear these every day, you're gonna burn through them pretty quickly. As far as the Cortez, I was really impressed with some of the times I got out of the Cortez, but I don't see doing any serious running in the Cortez again because they really killed my feet. Now, maybe if I had been able to get a hold of some of the nylon uppers instead of the leather uppers, there would have been difference. Nylon upper Cortezes are a lot softer, a lot more comfortable, a lot more flexible. Um, I had a pair of those and I ended up dropping a bottle of spaghetti sauce and it broke and got all over the shoes and I ended up just getting rid of them. I didn't even try and clean them. I kind of wish I still had them because I definitely would have used them in the runs here. And I think I probably would have got some better times out of it and definitely would have saved a lot of wear uh, and on my feet. But overall, I had fun with these run, had fun with these shoes. Um, I can't see this honestly as a shoe, as part of my permanent rotation. Um, primarily for price and durability reasons. Um, there's a lot, I think, better options at lower price for more durable and consistent runs, but it's a great, fun shoe. It's a fast shoe. It doesn't feel fast, but it gets you places fast. Um, so it, it, it was really uh, a joy to, to get a chance to run in these.